On the serene evening of December 3rd, 1957, in the quaint town of Sycamore, Illinois, two inseparable companions, Maria, aged seven, and Kathy, aged eight, reveled in the magic of the season's first snowfall. Oblivious to the impending peril, they played joyfully, engaging in a spirited game of duck the cars. Little did they know a mysterious young man was approaching, effortlessly weaving himself into their innocent circle. In a matter of moments, the course of their lives, as well as that of their families, would be irrevocably altered. The enigmatic stranger's identity and his true intentions remained shrouded in uncertainty. Since 1962, Sycamore, Illinois, has proudly hosted the annual Sycamore Pumpkin Festival, a tradition that began when local resident Wally Thoreau showcased pumpkins on his front lawn. Named after the majestic sycamore tree, this charming city is renowned for its family-friendly atmosphere and affordability, making it an ideal place to settle down. With its lush greenery and expansive parks, Sycamore offers a serene environment. While, like many towns, it has faced its share of crime, there has been a notable decrease over the past decade. The Sycamore of 1957, however, was a stark contrast to the vibrant community we know today. At that time, the most troubling incidents involved mere graffiti on sidewalks until a tragic event unfolded that captured the nation's attention, the disappearance and murder of Maria Ridolf. Maria Elizabeth Ridolf was born on March 2, 1950, to Michael and Francis Ridolf, the youngest of four siblings, including two sisters, Kathy and Pat, and an older brother, Chuck. Residing in Sycamore, her father was employed at a factory, while her mother dedicated herself to homemaking. As the youngest, Maria was cherished by her family, her radiant smile, sparkling brown eyes, and infectious laughter, drawing people to her effortlessly. Despite her charm, she was a somewhat anxious child, often described by her mother as high-strung and easily distressed in challenging situations. A diligent student, Maria attended Sunday school weekly and, in 1957, was a second grader at West Elementary School in Sycamore. At just seven years old, she was well-mannered, excelled academically, and had a wide circle of friends. Her teachers admired her expressive brown eyes and her joyful, resonant laughter. Her closest companion was her neighbor, eight-year-old Kathy Sigmund. The two girls shared a deep bond, walking to and from school together and frequently visiting each other's homes. As the first snowfall of the season blanketed the town, both girls eagerly anticipated the upcoming holiday festivities. On the 3rd of December in the year 1957, Maria and Kathy indulged in the art of crafting delicate paper snowflakes at Maria's abode. As the clock struck 5 p.m., Kathy gracefully bid farewell to partake in a delightful dinner with her beloved family. Meanwhile, Maria and her family gathered around to relish a lavish meal. However, Maria's appetite was not fully awakened, thus she partook in just a modest portion before begging her parents for permission to venture outside. During that era, the neighborhood where Maria resided was deemed a sanctuary of safety. Doors remained unlocked and incidents of theft were a rarity. Despite the cloak of darkness, Maria's parents graciously granted her the liberty to explore the outdoors. Subsequently, she reached out to Kathy's residence, seeking her presence to revel in the snowy wonderland. The two young ladies rendezvoused near a majestic tree at the intersection of Center Cross Street and Archie Place. A whimsical game of duck the cars ensued, where they sought refuge behind the tree upon spotting approaching headlights. Amidst this playful escapade, their attention was captivated by a young gentleman named Johnny. He approached them with charm, introducing himself as a 24-year-old bachelor. Johnny inquired if they derived pleasure from piggyback rides and dolls, to which Maria and Kathy responded affirmatively. Subsequently, Johnny extended a piggyback ride to Maria as Kathy politely declined. 
Maria dashed back home to retrieve one of her cherished dolls while Kathy awaited Johnny's company outside. Upon Maria's return, Johnny gallantly offered her a piggyback ride. As the chill of the evening crept in, Kathy expressed her desire to fetch mittens from home, inviting Maria to accompany her. However, Maria opted to remain in Johnny's company, prompting Kathy to embark on her errand solo. Upon her return, Maria and Johnny were nowhere to be found. Anxious and perplexed, Kathy sought solace at the Ridolf residence, recounting the mysterious disappearance to Maria's concerned parents. Maria's valiant brother, Chuck, embarked on a quest to scour the neighborhood in search of his missing sister, accompanied by his loyal friend, Randy, who had been visiting the Ridolf household. The two young gentlemen desperately sought after Maria, but she was nowhere to be found. Meanwhile, Michael escorted Kathy back to the comfort of her home. Once there, Kathy recounted the events to her mother, Flora, including the encounter with the mysterious man named Johnny. Flora wasted no time in contacting Francis, urging her to alert the authorities, although Michael hesitated. His reluctance stemmed from Maria's previous disappearance, where she was found innocently playing in a cemetery after wandering off. Maria's unexpected return home had prevented a full-scale search. Michael feared causing unnecessary panic. However, Frances, Maria's mother, held a different perspective and promptly drove to the police station to report her daughter missing. Initially, Chuck shared Michael's belief that Maria would return home on her own, but his certainty wavered when he stumbled upon Maria's beloved doll near a neighbor's garage. Realizing Maria wouldn't leave without her cherished toy, Chuck rushed back home to inform his father. The discovery sent shockwaves through Maria's family, prompting a swift response from law enforcement and concerned citizens who formed a search party. Despite their exhaustive efforts, Maria and Johnny remained elusive, yet hope persisted. As the search intensified, Kathy cooperated with the police, providing a detailed account of the events leading up to Maria's disappearance. Her description became a crucial piece of the puzzle in the quest to find Maria. Kathy depicted Johnny as a fair-haired man in his early twenties, with a gap between his front teeth, tall with a slender chin, and dressed in a vibrant sweater adorned with green, blue, and yellow stripes. The following day, local newspapers featured headlines about the mysterious disappearance of Maria and Johnny. Articles detailed descriptions of both Maria and her suspected abductor. Maria's parents turned to the media to appeal to the kidnapper, conducting interviews in hopes of getting their daughter back. Frances, Maria's mother, urged her to remain calm and assured her that they would be reunited soon. The police intensified their physical search, scouring car trunks and cellars for any sign of Maria. Every house in the town was meticulously searched, but to no avail. After two days, the Federal Bureau of Investigation joined the search, raising concerns that Maria may have been taken across state lines. The case became a national sensation, prompting J. Edgar Hoover, head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and United States President Dwight Eisenhower to take a personal interest in the matter, requesting regular updates on the progress. No expense was spared in the search for Maria. As aircraft scoured the town for the little girl and her abductor, they even went as far as to drain a lake and set off explosives at a local quarry in hopes of finding any trace of Maria, but to no avail. The police began to suspect that Maria's killer was not a local, but rather someone from out of town. They awaited communication from the kidnapper, but no ransom demand or contact was ever made, leading them to fear the worst. A week after Maria's disappearance, investigators advised search groups to be on the lookout for large flocks of carrion birds that might be feeding on a potential decomposing body. As the sole witness, Kathy was placed in protective custody, and investigators continued to show her images of potential suspects. Kathy struggled to find a photograph that accurately represented Johnny, and after several attempts with photo lineups, her confusion deepened. Ultimately, she identified a picture of a 35-year-old man named Thomas Joseph Rivard. 
This identification brought a sense of relief to both investigators and the family, as they believed they had pinpointed their suspect. However, Rivard had a credible alibi. He was incarcerated at the time of the kidnapping. Additionally, he was significantly older than Johnny, who had claimed to be 24 years old when he met the two girls. This revelation was disheartening, as it indicated that their sole eyewitness had been mistaken. Kathy remained under protective custody due to concerns that Johnny might attempt to silence her. During this period, investigators received a new lead that rekindled their hopes. On December 6, 1957, a woman contacted the police, suggesting that her neighbor, a young man named Trashner, resembled the suspect. However, records did not indicate anyone named Trashner residing in the vicinity, though there was a family with the surname Tessier. On December 8, 1957, Federal Bureau of Investigation agents visited the Tessier home, where Ralph and Eileen Tessier acknowledged that their eldest son, John, matched the suspect's description. Nevertheless, he had been in Rockford, 40 miles away, at the time of the abduction. This was substantiated by phone records, showing that the Tessiers received a call around 7 p.m. that evening, with the operator noting the caller as John Tessier. According to the family, John had called from Rockford to request a ride from his stepfather, Ralph. John was subsequently brought in for questioning, where he stated that on December 2nd and 3rd, 1957, he was in Chicago for physical examinations in preparation for enlisting in the U.S. military. He visited the Chicago Recruiting Center on the morning of December 3rd, and his account was supported by official records. He then enjoyed a day of exploring the sights of Chicago before returning to Rockford by train that very evening. John claimed to have reached Rockford at approximately 6.45 p.m. and promptly contacted his parents for a ride back home. Following that, he made a stop at the Rockford recruiting station to submit some paperwork. This account was further confirmed by officials who recalled meeting with John after 7 p.m. that night. However, they did mention that John appeared disoriented, almost as if he was recovering from the effects of a drug-induced experience. Subsequently, investigators decided to administer a lie detector test at the local police station. Given the circumstances and John's behavior, it was imperative to validate his credibility. Fortunately, John successfully passed the lie detector test. With his positive outcome and solid alibi, the Federal Bureau of Investigation eliminated John as a suspect. On December 11, 1957, John bid farewell to Sycamore and enlisted at Lackland Air Force Base to commence his basic training. The investigator's sole lead had turned out to be a dead end, prolonging the search for Maria well into the festive season and beyond. The Riddle family remained in a state of uncertainty, grappling with the decision of whether to maintain hope for Maria's safe return. Tragedy struck on April 26, 1958, when a couple searching for mushrooms near Woodbine, Illinois, stumbled upon skeletal remains near a fallen tree. Initially mistaking it for that of a small animal or a dog, a closer examination revealed that it was the body of a young child. The child was still dressed in a shirt, undershirt, and white socks. The couple promptly contacted the authorities from the nearest farmhouse. Upon arrival, the police noted the advanced state of decomposition and concluded that the body had been there for several months. James Furlong, the coroner at the time, instructed the crime scene technicians to take photographs of the general area, but not of the child, as he was keen on preventing any potential leaks to the media. Authorities had their suspicions regarding the identity of the deceased, and following a thorough examination, Maria Ridolf was definitively identified through her dental records, the shirt she had worn, and a lock of her hair. Her remains were discovered five months later, over a hundred miles from her home in Sycamore. Unfortunately, the remainder of Maria's clothing was never recovered. An autopsy failed to ascertain a specific cause of death, yet it was classified as a homicide. Since Maria was found within Illinois, 
The Federal Bureau of Investigation stepped back from the investigation, leaving it in the hands of state and local law enforcement. Later that week, Maria Ridolph was laid to rest at Elmwood Cemetery in Sycamore, with over 300 mourners attending her funeral. The tragedy left her family and friends heartbroken, mourning the loss of a vibrant spirit extinguished by a cruel act. With heavy hearts, they prayed for justice. Those who paid tribute at her funeral remembered her as a bright and joyful girl. The hymn, Jesus Loves Me, her favorite, resonated throughout the service. Following the funeral, Kathy remained under protective custody, her life irrevocably altered. She became known as the girl last seen with Maria, making it increasingly difficult for her to forge new friendships, as many were apprehensive. The tragedy of Maria Ridolph's murder cast a long shadow over the lives of all involved. A year after Maria's disappearance, the large tree where she and Kathy had played that fateful evening was felled. Investigators continued their pursuit of the case, but it ultimately grew cold. With no fresh leads and their primary suspect ruled out, the investigation stagnated. Although it remained an open cold case, newer investigations took precedence, and soon Maria's murder faded into a haunting memory for those left behind. The aftermath was a profound disappointment for the Ridolf family, as the flicker of hope they had briefly nurtured was extinguished by yet another false lead. The investigation had reached an impasse, remaining stagnant for decades. It would take another forty years before a fresh lead surfaced. After four long decades, a case that had cast a shadow over both the Ridolf family and the entire community of Sycamore finally identified a suspect. In 1997, Sycamore Police Lieutenant Patrick Sola proposed the name of a new individual of interest. He indicated that William Henry Redmond, a former truck driver and carnival worker, might have been the one responsible for the tragic fate of Maria Ridolph. Unfortunately, Redmond had passed away in 1992, yet Solar was convinced that his criminal background aligned with the profile of the perpetrator. According to Solar, Redmond had confided in fellow inmates about committing a crime akin to Maria's abduction. He also noted that Redmond's demeanor and physical characteristics bore a resemblance to the suspect known as Johnny. However, Solar's investigation and subsequent findings faced scrutiny due to the absence of concrete evidence, a point he himself acknowledged, deeming it circumstantial at best. The case was subsequently classified as closed but unsolved, leaving the door open for the possibility of uncovering a more credible suspect in the future. Despite the passage of time, Kathy never escaped the haunting memories of that fateful night Psychologists identified her struggle as survivor's guilt. In her adulthood, she relocated from Sycamore after meeting Mark Chapman in the early 70s. Following their marriage, Kathy and Mark settled in Texas, later moving to Florida, where they raised three children. Yet the specter of that evening lingered in Kathy's mind, as she often pondered whether Johnny was still lurking in the shadows, waiting for her. By the mid-2000s, Kathy and her family returned to Illinois. Many in the community referred to Maria's disappearance and subsequent death as Sycamore's 9-11, a tragedy that irrevocably altered the town's landscape. Decades later, investigators were finally alerted to a tantalizing clue, a newly uncovered lead that promised to reignite the long-dormant case. In 2008, 51 years after Maria Ridolph's tragic disappearance and murder, fresh information came to light, offering a glimmer of hope in the relentless pursuit of justice. The case was on the brink of a dramatic twist. Long-buried secrets from the past of Maria, dating back to 1958, began to resurface. Janet Tessier, the half-sister of John Tessier, took matters into her own hands by reaching out to the Sycamore police tip line. In a detailed email, she pointed the finger at her half-brother John, accusing him of the abduction and murder of seven-year-old Maria Ridolph. Janet revealed that her mother, Eileen, had made a deathbed confession, prompting her to come forward. Despite being initially dismissed by the local police, 
Janet persisted and eventually caught the attention of detectives Larry Cott and Brian Hanley, who decided to reopen the case. In her email, Janet recounted the chilling events of that December night. She disclosed that John had adopted the alias Jack Daniel McCullough in memory of their late mother. As detectives delved deeper into Janet's claims, they confirmed that John had indeed changed his name to Jack Daniel McCullough in 1994. The time had come for them to launch their own inquiry into the true identity of Jack McCullough. Born John Cherry on November 27, 1939, in Belfast, Northern Ireland, Jack had a tumultuous upbringing. His father, a British sergeant, perished early in World War II, leaving his mother Eileen to fend for herself. Eileen later crossed paths with Ralph Tessier, a member of the United States 8th Army Air Force, and the two tied the knot in 1944. Together with young John, they relocated to Sycamore, Illinois. The Tessier family expanded their brood with six additional children, and John adopted the surname Tessier, though he occasionally referred to himself as John Cherry. Residing merely two blocks from the Ridolph household in Sycamore, John was regarded by his siblings as their mother's favored child, often receiving her protection during his misadventures. His academic journey took a downturn in the 10th grade when he was expelled for pushing a teacher and hurling an obscene insult at her, an incident his mother reportedly chose to overlook. At the time of Maria's mysterious disappearance, John was 18 and still under his parents' roof. Although he had intentions of enlisting in the U.S. Air Force, previous investigations in 1957 had cleared him of any suspicion by both the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Sycamore Police Department. However, renewed allegations prompted detectives to delve deeper into John Tessier's history. They interviewed his half-sisters, Catherine and Janine, who claimed to have overheard their mother conversing with the police on the night Maria vanished. They accused Eileen of misleading authorities regarding John's whereabouts that evening, but the most shocking revelations were yet to come. Allegations surfaced that John had harassed Janine during his time with the family, and he had garnered a notorious reputation in the neighborhood. A witness, Pamela Long, recounted an incident where her father had to step in when John refused to set her down after a piggyback ride. Shortly thereafter, John enlisted in the Air Force, leading to a rift with his family, as he instructed them not to attend their mother's funeral. After dedicating 13 years to the military and retiring as a captain, he relocated to Seattle, Washington, where he graduated from the police academy in June 1974. John subsequently joined the Lacey Police Department before transferring to the Milton Police Department, where he found himself at odds with the police chief, who possessed evidence of his misconduct. A number of women accused John of harassment, but the decisive blow to his defense came from the testimony of Michelle Weinman, who was just 15 years old in 1982. A known runaway, Weinman had crossed paths with John during his tenure as a police officer in Milton, where he offered her shelter. She alleged that he had behaved inappropriately towards her, ultimately leading her to file formal charges of abuse against him. Initially facing a felony charge, John saw the severity of the accusation reduced to a misdemeanor following plea negotiations, to which he pleaded guilty for communicating with a minor for immoral purposes. Consequently, he was sentenced to one year of formal probation and was dismissed from the Milton Police Department on March 10, 1982. In a bid for a fresh start, John changed his name to Jack McCullough on April 27, 1994, and pursued a career as an amateur photographer until 2001. The sole piece of evidence supporting John's alibi was a phone call made from Rockford on the night of December 3, 1957. But this alibi began to unravel when investigators reached out to a former girlfriend of his. During the initial inquiry, police had failed to provide their witness, Kathy Sigmund, with a photograph of John Tessier, as he had dropped out of school and was absent from the yearbook. 
However, upon reopening the investigation, they contacted his former girlfriend, Jen Swafford, who furnished them with the more recent photograph of John. Unbeknownst to her, Jen was about to provide crucial evidence that would significantly impact the case. She presented the police with an unused military-issued train ticket from Rockford to Chicago, leading them to suspect that John had driven his own vehicle to Chicago. He had claimed to have spent December 3, 1957, sightseeing in the city, which raised the possibility that he could have driven to Sycamore that afternoon, abducted Maria, and returned to Rockford within the time frame. The police then revisited the timeline for further scrutiny. Numerous witnesses attested to not having seen Maria or Kathy playing outside after 6.20 p.m. that evening. Among them was a bus driver who distinctly recalled not spotting any girls outside when he made a turn around 6.30 p.m. Another witness mentioned seeing John's Pontiac in the vicinity of Sycamore on the evening Maria went missing. This witness was certain that John never permitted anyone else to drive his car. Recruiter's statements placed John in Rockford around 7 p.m., and considering the proximity of the locations, it was plausible that he could have been in Sycamore that same evening. Furthermore, one of the recruiters John encountered on December 4, 1957, observed a cut on John's lip. Allegedly, John remarked that it was fortunate he hadn't been in Sycamore the previous night when the young girl vanished. These statements, along with others from witnesses, were part of the Federal Bureau of Investigation's initial investigation. However, the new team of investigators operated under the belief that the timeline from the original inquiry was entirely inaccurate. Based on the revised timeline, investigators postulated that John had driven to Sycamore, abducted Maria around 6.20 p.m., and then returned to Rockford to make the call to his family. Testimony from John's half-sister, Catherine, supported the notion that the timeline was skewed, as she recalled the police search commencing at 7 p.m. that night. Catherine mentioned returning from a party and witnessing the search in progress, pushing the original timeline back by more than an hour. The focus then shifted to the sole eyewitness, Kathy Sigmund Chapman. Kathy was presented with various potential suspect photos, including one of John Tessier from his former girlfriend. Without hesitation, she identified John as the man she believed was Johnny from years past. On the luxurious day of June 29, 2011, the 71-year-old John Tessier, now known as Jack McCullough, was gracefully escorted into custody by officers from the Seattle Police Department, for a thorough interrogation. With his esteemed background in law enforcement, he was interrogated by impeccably trained interviewers and vehemently refuted any involvement in the heinous kidnapping and murder of Maria. He eloquently expressed that Maria was a cherished child in their esteemed neighborhood. When questioned about the scandalous allegations involving his half-sister, he eloquently denied the claims, attributing it to mere youthful antics. As inquiries regarding Maria's disappearance persisted, Jack elegantly evaded further questioning and adamantly refused to provide any more information. Subsequently, he was apprehended for the abduction and murder of Maria Ridolf and extradited to the esteemed state of Illinois. For the remaining members of the Ridolf family, justice for Maria was finally served. The passage of time was of no consequence, as they now had a name, and their quest for closure was nearing its conclusion. On July 27, 2011, Jack made a dignified appearance in court, coinciding with the exhumation of Maria's remains by diligent investigators. A distinguished forensic anthropologist was able to ascertain that Maria had indeed suffered at least three stab wounds to the throat, as evidenced by marks on her bones. Stabbing was thus deemed a probable cause of death, as the advanced state of decomposition had hindered coroners from the initial investigation in determining a definitive cause. The arrest captured the attention of the entire nation, prompting both the Ridolf and Tessier families to exert pressure on Clay Campbell, who then held the position of DeKalb County State Attorney. 
Despite his initial reluctance due to the age of the case and the absence of tangible evidence linking Jack to the crime, he eventually acquiesced. Jack McCullough was formally indicted for the abduction and murder of Maria Ridolf, and the case proceeded to trial in the month of September 2012. At the age of 73, Jack McCullough faced trial. The prosecution posited that Jack harbored an infatuation for Maria, citing his vivid recollections of the girl as indicative of an unhealthy obsession. They could never definitively prove whether Jack had assaulted Maria before her tragic death, but they contended that new evidence pointed towards her being stabbed. Numerous witnesses took the stand, recounting Jack's questionable behavior and misconduct throughout his youth and police career. Three inmates provided conflicting testimonies, each claiming a different method of Maria's murder. One said she was strangled with a wire, while another insisted she was smothered to silence her screams. However, it was Kathy Sigmund Chapman's testimony that ultimately sealed Jack McCullough's fate, confirming that he was the same man she knew as Johnny. Jack's defense team argued that the case was reopened under pressure from the Ridolf and Tessier families, emphasizing the lack of physical evidence, motive, or proof of Jack's involvement in Maria's abduction and murder. They relied on the possibility of faulty memories and inconsistent witness testimonies to cast doubt on the prosecution's case. Despite their efforts, the jury ultimately found Jack guilty of Maria Ridolf's abduction and murder on September 14, 2012, sentencing him to life in prison with a chance of parole after 20 years. Just when the Ridolf family thought they could finally find closure, the case took an unexpected turn. Even though many believed it was resolved, the case was far from over. On February 13, 2015, Jack appealed his convictions, leading to the Illinois Appellate Court overturning his kidnapping conviction due to the statute of limitations and upholding the murder charge. The court also ruled that the deathbed confession should not have been admitted as evidence, but it did not impact the judge's decision. In the year 2015, Jack once more sought to have his murder conviction annulled. He adeptly filed a motion that facilitated a hearing with the state attorney's office. The newly appointed state attorney, Richard Schmack, assumed control of the case and reopened it, embarking on a thorough examination of the evidence, which included subpoenaed phone records from the fateful night. During a court hearing in March 2016, Schmack presented a compelling argument, asserting that the phone records the timelines from the original investigation, the omission of crucial evidence during the trial, and the weather conditions on December 3, 1957, rendered it impossible for Jack to have been in Sycamore at the time of Maria's disappearance. It was also revealed that prior to the new polygraph examination, Jack had insisted that investigators limit their inquiries to the 1957 case. When the interviewer deviated from this focus, Jack chose to bypass those questions, declining to respond. The prosecution contended that he was still subjected to inquiries unrelated to the Maria Ridolf case, suggesting that the polygraph was employed to foster a biased narrative against Jack. Consequently, the judgment concluded that Jack had been honest regarding his involvement in the Maria Ridolf case during both the 1957 polygraph test and the subsequent one conducted in 2011, deeming all other information irrelevant to the investigation. Following the trial in March 2016, Judge William Brady vacated Jack's murder conviction on April 15, 2016, and ordered a new trial. The vacating of the conviction was based on the understanding that these new factors, while significant, did not collectively rise to the level of a reasonable probability of a different outcome, as agreed upon by the state. In essence, the parties concurred that these factual allegations were indeed true. The court recognized that the defendant had fulfilled his obligations under both the post-conviction petition and the two-to-one or two-to-one petition, thus granting the request for a new trial. That very day, Jack was released on bond. 
Judge Brady's declaration opened the door for a potential retrial of Jack for murder, should a new prosecutor choose to challenge the conviction. On August 5, 2016, the motion for a special prosecutor, brought by Maria's brother, Charles Ridolph, was denied by Judge Brady. Charles subsequently announced that he would not be appealing the ruling. On April 12, 2017, Jack McCullough was acquitted of the crime by the DeKalb County Circuit Court. Following Schmack's allegations of police misconduct during a request to retry the case on November 3, 2015, Jack's son-in-law filed a lawsuit against the Sycamore Police Department and Illinois State Police on July 21, 2016, for failing to comply with the Freedom of Information Act. Jack's civil rights lawyer emphasized the urgent need for justice system reform, citing Illinois as the epicenter for wrongful convictions. In July 2020, Jack received a $300,000 settlement from the city of Seattle after filing a lawsuit against the police department and detectives involved in his investigation and arrest. The case of Maria Ridolph remains unsolved, despite an anonymous letter naming another suspect. The investigators have yet to release the name of the new suspect, likely due to the necessity of thoroughly verifying the evidence following the tumultuous investigation that led to the wrongful arrest of an innocent man. On the 24th of March in the year 2001, a New Bedford neighborhood was left in shock and fear as news spread of a woman found murdered in her Cushman Avenue residence. The authorities were alerted through a 911 call to the communications center, reporting an unresponsive female. This tragic tale revolves around the life of 41-year-old Rose Marie Moniz, who met a brutal end in her New Bedford, Massachusetts home in March 2001. For over 20 years, her murder remained a mystery until recent DNA evidence discovered inside a conch shell pointed towards her half-brother as the perpetrator. Shockingly, it was revealed that the very person who carried her coffin at her funeral was the one responsible for her demise. The heinous nature of this crime was as appalling as it was savage. On the morning of March 23, 2001, Moniz's father arrived at her home to take her to a doctor's appointment, only to be met with a gruesome sight. The kitchen was in disarray, her purse had been ransacked, and she was found lifeless in a pool of blood in the bathroom. The autopsy report detailed severe head injuries, including skull fractures, deep cuts, and other wounds that led to bleeding from her ears, broken nasal bones, and a fractured left cheekbone. She had also suffered blunt force trauma all over her body. Despite the belief that robbery was the motive, there were no signs of forced entry into the residence. The investigation into this case hit a dead end soon after it began, with two potential suspects being ruled out early on. For twenty long years, her family endured the agony of her brutal death without knowing the identity of her assailant. Fred Kunha, the brother of Moniz, shared with local news outlets that, over the years, various individuals associated with the family had come under suspicion, including Moniz's own son. For the past two decades, a shadow has loomed over my nephew, Fred remarked. He had made a solemn promise to his parents that the identity of the murderer would ultimately be uncovered, and indeed, that promise was fulfilled. I consistently assured my mother and father that we would discover the truth, he stated, and his unwavering faith in the investigation bore fruit. In 2019, a thorough review by the Bristol County District Attorney's Office and the Massachusetts State Police Unresolved Crimes Unit unearthed crucial evidence that could lead to the capture of Rosemary's killer. This time, the Cold Case Detectives Unit scrutinized the conch shell with renewed vigor, Autopsy images revealed that the victim had endured multiple abrasions and contusions, indicating that the jagged surface of the conch shell had made contact with her face. This evidence implied that the assailant must have inserted their fingers into the shell's opening to wield it with sufficient force to inflict such severe injuries. DNA testing of the shell's interior yielded a complete profile, 
which was subsequently entered into the Combined DNA Index System, the National DNA Database. This pivotal discovery pointed to the primary suspect in the murder of Rose Marie Moniz, her half-brother, 53-year-old David Reed. Reed's DNA had previously been catalogued in connection with a 2003 assault and robbery involving a new Bedford woman who had suffered a brutal beating with a tire iron. In August 2020, authorities reported a brief conversation with Reed, who was residing in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Following this encounter, he allegedly fled to Alabama, where he found employment at a lumber yard until investigators tracked him down. Over the next year, he traversed to California, Hawaii, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island, seemingly attempting to evade capture. On the 10th of September, law enforcement apprehended him at the Providence Rescue Mission Shelter in Rhode Island. Apart from the tragic incident involving Moniz, Reed faces serious charges in Bristol County for armed assault with intent to murder and armed robbery related to a 2003 attack in New Bedford. Presently, Reed is detained in prison for the 2003 offense. The legal proceedings for Moniz's murder are pending, and it remains uncertain whether he has legal representation or has responded to the accusations.